Today's gospel lesson is from the first chapter of Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever felt that the world is just going round and round and round and round? And that somehow, sometimes it seems that none of us are really getting anywhere? Surely you have caught a glimpse of that in this season of pandemic, the Groundhog Day experience of our lives so closed in and our uh, life outside so diminished. A friend who I now work with remarked upon his experience as he watches the national divisions and the protests over racism and the turmoil of our public life. He described it as coming full circle because he began his work, my friend Rigo Reyes, he began his work in the 1960s during the period of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement and it's all just coming full circle, he says, as he revisits those days almost 50 years ago. Have you ever just felt that things are just going round and around and around and we're None of us not really getting anywhere. We're creatures of habit, it turns out, and the communities we create are reflections of ourselves. This is one of the things that makes this experience so powerful is that we revisit and we reinforce these habits of ours. Most strikingly and most perilously of all these habits we develop are sometimes bad habits that are based on our greatest gifts. Uh, as individuals, the passionate among us can become addicted to sex. The devout among us can become self-absorbed. The justice-minded can become ruthlessly uncompromising. The worshipful can become holier than thou. And in our national life, it is our individualism, our freedom that makes this country so great. At the same time, it is what renders us vulnerable to fragmentation, to factionalism. Our great spirit of national aspiration can cause us to trample other peoples. Our Protestant spirit, that spirit of protest, can tempt us to want to convert every cause of ours into a holy war. We praise God and celebrate the fact that God is on our side, but sometimes we convert that to a prayer of pride, proclaiming that God is on our side. We're creatures of habit and the communities we create are reflections of ourselves and we find ourselves sometimes as if stuck in a rut. The world just seems to go round and around and around and sometimes it doesn't feel like we're getting anywhere. Where can we find hope in this part of our human experience? The recurring, the returning, the turning of the wheel that is a part of our daily life and that is a part of our human existence on this earth. Today's gospel lesson is a foundational story in which Jesus calls the disciples and his command is on the face of it quite simple, 
He says, lay down your nets and follow me. And the first disciples do exactly that. It launches them on a journey in which they will follow Jesus and in which Jesus himself will explore his calling and fulfill his mission, a mission that we now know ends on the cross and the grave and Easter resurrection. But the disciples didn't know that at the time. They were just responding to this call, this mysterious call, and they made a bold decision to follow Jesus. They set themselves, as it were, on a journey following Jesus. To follow Jesus is to commit ourselves to practices and ways of life that we hope and pray will mold us and shape us to become more like him. We seek to transform ourselves through repetition, through muscle memory, through spiritual memory. We attempt to transform ourselves more and more into the shape of Jesus. We attempt to live cross-shaped lives. We practice these basic practices Worship, devotion, compassion, justice. Those of you who have participated in covenant discipleship groups are familiar with this way of thinking about the Christian life. Small groups in which people hold themselves accountable to one another and come back week after week to share their lives together, to share how they've done this past week in these practices. Did they worship God with their whole hearts? Did they practice prayer and fasting and reading of the scriptures? Did they express compassion to others? Did they commit themselves to small acts of justice in the world? Did we do these things? This is the life of faith. But there is a secret to this way of thinking about the Christian journey, a secret ingredient, if you will, drives us forward in the spiritual life and it makes a profound difference because it, instead of feeling like we're going around and around in a circle, this secret ingredient drives things forward and turns the circle into a spiral that moves forward through time. The ingredients is repentance. Jesus proclaimed in our gospel lesson his first public proclamation in the Gospel of Mark, the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. It's repentance that drives us in this life to move forward. We return, yes, to those mistakes and the uh, injustices of our past, but we redeem them through repentance. God redeems us through our repentance and God's grace known to us through our repentance drives us forward and prevents us from just simply getting stuck in place. We're moving on to perfection. Those of us who have committed to following Jesus, if we're not moving on to perfection, we either get stuck in place or worse yet, in the language of our Methodist forebears, we backslide and become less and less the people that God is calling us to be. It's repentance that drives us forward because we seek out God and we pray God's blessing on us. We plead for God's forgiveness and God bestows upon us new grace, new power, new hope. And the new day becomes a new day, a new opportunity to live more fully as followers of Jesus. We turn that circle into a spiral. We no longer feel that we are stuck in a rut, but we feel we are moving on toward Christian perfection. We feel that we are becoming more and more holy day by day. And not every day, maybe, but over time we feel that we have drawn closer to God and we have drawn closer to our neighbor by these foundational practices worship, devotion, compassion, justice, and by the power of God's Holy Spirit upon us through the ongoing and never-ending practice of repentance. 
You've known people in your life, as I have, who have demonstrated what this way of living looks like. People who stand out to us as exemplars of faith because they continued in their journey, even to the very edge of death. As I look at these empty pews, I cannot help but fill them in my mind's imagination with people who I've known and loved, who have lived out their faith in the context of this congregation. I think of Elizabeth Cogdill. I think of so many people who practice their faith in the context of this community, First Church San Diego, and who demonstrated this life of ever forward movement through the journey of faith. It is our hope, my friends, that we can follow in their footsteps, that we too in our day can follow Jesus. It's such a simple command he gives, but it is not easy, is it? For in this life we are tempted always to attach our desires to so many things, to take our points of strength and turn them into points of pride. And yet that call of Jesus comes again and again and again to us. It's simple, but it's not easy because it demands that we set our other commitments at a, another level of priority and we renew our primary and ultimate commitment over and over again to Jesus, whose command sounds perhaps more like this, follow me, follow me, follow me. Our National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gordon, captured something beautifully, many things beautifully, this past Wednesday at Joe Biden's inauguration. I was struck by this turn of phrase, and yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose. Do you hear the forward momentum in that calling? Charles Wesley, the founder of Methodism with his brother John, put it this way in his hymn, finish then thy new creation, true and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee lost in wonder love and praise so i join with pastor ka with reverend trudy with the leaders of this congregation inviting you in this season this season of hope and season of repentance, that you will find your life moving forward and that you will hear anew Jesus call on you this day and that the voice that comes ringing down through the ages declaring, follow me, will inspire you to live a life worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus. And if you do, if we do, we'll come to the end of our days and we'll have drawn that spiral over and over again. And we'll have become more and more equipped, more suited, more prepared to live our life in eternity with God, who alone is perfect. The spiral may not be perfect in our human way of thinking. It may not be flawless, but there's another definition for perfect. It simply means complete. Oh, may we come to the end of our days having lived a complete life, a life that is drawn full circle and that moves always toward justice and worship. 
toward devotion and compassion, a life that moves always and everywhere toward Jesus. Amen.